look at your your desk i was, was like oh what's there oh you want, you want to see more there we go uh, <laughs> Outdoors, yeah. Oh, nice. Very nice. Very nice. I like getting, I like getting your, a whole view. Oh, there's, there's the cat. The cat. Oh, very <laughs> Work <laughs> companion like, number one. If you don't one. have a cat on the table, you can't do anything. You know, so. <laughs> Engage the cat. <laughs> very important. The cats are annoyed. We've been too interested in the mice <laughs> for a long time now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when I got when I got served by his attorney about that, that that was it. I had to, I had to comply. <laughs> I was on a call the other day when suddenly, like this whole screen went black, and we we're like, "What happened? Did she drop off?" And she said, and after a while, it cleared, and she went, "That was Venus. She was just making her <laughs> self known." <laughs> we see a lot. Every so Venus would walk by. I see a lot of the black tail go by, but that's yeah. Yeah, this was a full body. I mean, it blocked the entire I screen. So, yeah. <laughs> I am really here. Yeah. <laughs> up and sometimes they'll just come right up on my shoulder, just peeks up, wants to say hello. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, oh, funny. Actually, that's uh, my sister works for for a small university in Minneapolis, and she said. It's been really challenging not having the team around, but she feels like they know each other on a much more intimate level mm -hmm. because you're peering into somebody's house and then in the doorway, mm -hmm. there comes the kid wanting something yeah. or the dog or the cat or something like that. So you get a real sense of people's surroundings. And she said, that's been interesting. I think it's humanized us. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Interesting. I came up in conversation this morning and then with Rick yesterday and then Jerome DeRoy this morning with chatting. Sarah, I, th I think we're pretty good. We're at 12.04. So if someone joins us. Okay. Super, super. So I'm going to step back. I'm done. Well, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sarah Armstrong. I'm in Berkeley, California. So it's just a little after nine o'clock here. Uh, I know we're spread across the country, which is awesome. I'm on the board of uh, storytelling and organizations and delighted to be here this morning and uh, share the hosting um, uh, uh, responsibilities with um, our, our beloved Jules. <clears throat> so just a few housekeeping things. You, you're going to be muted whether you want to be or not shortly. Um, but of course, we have our question and answer time later on when you will be unmuted and uh, can ask Mary Alice um, all about what she had to say and what she's going to be doing and so on. Um, let's see. So we're going to mute everybody. Yes, I guess so now. So Sarah, just watch your papers. They're making a really loud sound on the microphone. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we want to welcome Mary Alice Arthur to our group today. Uh, Mary Alice was one of the founding folks of SIO SIG in the way before time, mm -hmm. right? Mary Alice, it's been long, you know, long before ago. Before time was before just before there were cell phones. Well, I heard long time ago before when um, plastic bags were free. <laughs> anyway, you don't live in Ohio; they're still free. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Well, they're not free here. So, anyway, I'm delighted to have you here today, Mary Alice. It's so good to see you. And Mary Alice is a story activist. She uses the power of story for positive systemic change and shift. She helps new paradigm leaders discover and cultivate the story of their most flourishing future and create the capacity to bring that story to life. She's the author of Recently Out, 365 Live, Find Your Voice, Claim Your Story, Live Your Brilliant Life. And she's the host of The Story Dojo, which is a practice community I'm sure she'll tell us more about. So, Mary Alice, we're so delighted Thank to you have so you much. here. Please. And I love seeing some friendly faces in the audience and faces I want to get to know. That's beautiful. And Sarah, I was just thinking how long it's been since we've seen each other in person. Yeah. And that's, yeah. hmm. um, in fact, right now I'm in, I'm in a bit of, a bit of uh, extended, I'm in a, a long distance relationship because my suitcase is in the basement. <laughs> this has virtually never happened before in my life. And I was thinking the other day, I don't think there's been any time in my life where I've actually slept in the same bed for more than a year. That yeah. was a bit of a shocker. I kind of thought back and went, you know, even when you're a kid, your parents take you somewhere and then they put you down there and they put you down there. And my parents were both teachers, so they like to go camping in the summertime. So I, I really was like, 
no, this has never happened in my life before. Interesting milestone. But the other milestone I was realizing was it was 2003 when I first heard about storytelling in organizations and went to the Golden Fleece Conference in Washington, D.C. and met up with Steve Denning and Madeline Blair and Seth Kahn and many others who were just kind of probing the field at the time. And in, the, in that same year, I went to Singapore during the midst of SARS, <laughs> just in case we think this is the only time a pandemic has happened, in the midst of SARS to meet Dave Snowden for the first time and hear about the Kinevin model and the work he'd been doing on story. So back then it felt like a very edgy and unusual thing to be thinking about and pondering on. And I look at today and think, wow, we are mainstream. Everybody's talking about story. And that makes it once again interesting from my perspective, because I ask myself, how are they talking about story? And what do they think story actually is? And in the work I do, I'm very interested in how do we actually become really awake to how story is working in this world and become skillful at using it. And even beyond that, safeguard the, the, the kind of central fire of story as an intrinsic human capacity. It's not a tool, it's not a methodology, it's how we're encoded to understand the world. So how do we help people understand the power they have in here, in, you know, in, in everything that they are and how that actually works? So I've often surprised people by saying to them, uh, for me, I don't think there's any innocent story. Stories want something from us. And there are people who tell, who are innocent in their telling, but every story wants something. It might be, please understand me, or can you help me go to sleep? Or I don't, I want to understand what happened just now. Can you be with me in my grief? I'm a, I'm a big, big badass leader. I want you to follow me. You know, like stories want something. And we're in that kind of critical phase where we are in that movement of stories being commoditized like they are everywhere else. And they're also being weaponized. And so it's an interesting thing to be inviting all the people we work with to become awake at a certain level and to be skillful at what they're doing. I love how Paul Costello in Washington, D.C., who's with storywise.com, says, you know, the most important real estate on the planet is right here between your ears because stories will want to come and live rent free in your head. The question is, are you going to let them? So what I wanted to share with you today beyond that, just that, that was my little soapbox. <laughs> that's really, that's really what my book is about. And what I'm, you know, I'm passionate about is that invitation to please come back to the fire and bring your story with you. And let's see what we have together, but getting really practical into the business side of things. It's been interesting for me to join my two loves of facilitation and story over time. So I've been a facilitator now more than 25 years as LinkedIn likes to remind me every so often. If you're hearing noise right at the moment, I apologize because they are power washing the house. And of course, it came right now in this moment when we're talking. And I thought they were done with my corner, but okay. <laughs> it's not rain. It's actually self-applied. Um, so facilitation, how to work with groups, how to be skillful in helping groups go from coming together to achieving an outcome and stay in relationship during the time they're doing it. That's the most important thing. We want to do tasks, but we have relationship that's needed in order for a task to get done well. If you don't stay in good relationship, you really haven't been successful by the end. So there's that piece. So in Art of Hosting, a community I'm part of, we really are looking at how do you host and harvest conversations that matter? And then on the story side, I'm the one that's kind of brought story into the Art of Hosting world to say our stories are what color our agency, how we see and how we be in the world. So how do we use those well? So it's interesting to me that I'm kind of carrying these two fields with me, maybe an angel on each shoulder. And it was at one point in time when I was asked to do a story workshop in Russia, of all places, that I suddenly realized, and we're missing Artum here in our circle, he'll probably join later. But I suddenly realized that a meeting is a story. That might not sound that that might sound like a bagatbo, as my colleagues in New Zealand like to say, a blinding glimpse, glimpse of the bloody obvious. <laughs> but for me, it was a, an interesting and salient moment. So I just want to show you a pattern that's really fascinating when you think about meetings and put story on top of it and see what we think about it. So let me do a share screen right at the moment. Share. Can you see this? So let me go push play. 
So this is about a, a story in every meeting. So essentially, this is the pattern. In Art of Hosting, we call it the breath pattern. It's based on Sam Kaner's work. Sam Kaner is a facilitator based in San Francisco Bay Area and his colleagues who wrote about what he called the diamond of participation. Art of Hosting has taken this and it's called it the breath pattern. Why? Because the breath is intrinsic to humans, like in, out, that's what we're doing all the time. Otherwise, you're not a human being anymore, right? So the breath is in incredibly important, but it's also a really unrealized thing that we do automatically until it, it isn't happening well. And the pandemic has put a bit of a focus on the breath, intriguingly enough. But this pattern happens in any meeting, no matter if it's an hour, if it's uh, a day, if it's three days, if it's a month, this pattern is going to happen over and over. It's a natural uh, occurring pattern, and it's interesting to know about it. So, you know, everybody comes into a meeting going, hey, I'm curious, I wonder if we're going to hit the green check mark on the other end of the side, you know, we're going to achieve what we wanted to and, uh, you know, the pathway should be straight there. Only being human, it's never straight there, is it? There's always an interesting and wandering pathway. But these are the parts of the pathway, divergence, emergence, convergence. Let me say something about that. So in the beginning, as we come together, even if we've met a lot before, we still have that curiosity in our mind, who is here? How are we going to work the work that we want to do together? If it's listening, if it's innovation, if it's uh, working on a task, and what's going to happen? And for very many people, if these questions aren't answered really well, they get stuck right at the back in the beginning, because this might be what you term Maslow's hierarchy or the hierarchy of needs. I want to know how it's going to unfold in order to be really present. So in this stage of the meeting, I like to say, do what I call speak to the thought bubble. So here's the thought bubble that's going on. Hey, what's this really about? Who's here? Who am I in this group? And what can we each offer? And the who am I in that group is thing are things like, am I going to be respected? Is my, does my voice count? Well, uh, you know, who has the power in this room? The other day I was on Clubhouse and somebody was saying, my job is in the world is to make sure trust comes back to organizations. And I looked at who was speaking and I thought to myself, the fact that you are raising this as a white man, as a young white man, is interesting because trust is a conversation that is a privileged conversation. You can't expect people are going to approach it the same way you are because they haven't had that experience you've had. Maybe it's hard for them to trust because of what's happened before. But usually for people who like this part of the conversation, this is where we're getting to know each other. People are discovering what everybody has to offer. If you like that kind of thing, it's wonderful. But if you want to do something innovative or new, eventually you're going to come past what I call the point of no return, the end of the known universe. You're going to go into emergence. And that's a moment where suddenly the fog bank can arrive where suddenly you, in the beginning, you might've thought, we're wonderful, we're the perfect group, but this is the moment where you go, I hate you, I hate myself. I wanna run screaming from this room, what the heck is going on? So it's this kind of a thought bubble. Hey, wait a minute, but I wanted to, and you, uh-oh, uh -oh, can I really stay here? If you're skillful as a facilitator, as a host, as a leader, as a storyteller even, then eventually you get to that point where you clear the fog bank and you get to something new, you come to a breakthrough. In the art of hosting world, we call this part emergence, we call it the groan zone because it actually really feels like that, I've got a stomach ache moment. It sounds really good in German, it's Knirschzone, that's the word, which is the sound that your teeth make when they grind together, very appropriate. But if you can get through emergence together, everybody's still in the boat, then you get to convergence. That's kind of like the pointy end where we're going to get on to the plan about what's going to happen, how's it going to happen, and who's going to do it. If you've worked with engineers or people who are quite analytical, often they're in this convergence piece. That's where they want to be. That's why they're continuing to drive for where's the action? Where's the action? Whereas the people who are really people, people love divergence. There's only some people and they're interesting people who like being in that kind of place of all possibility who like emergence. So what's your favorite part of this? It's interesting to know. If you really wanna help people get through a meeting, you need to be able to host through all of these things. And here's the thought bubble in the end. What's the plan? Who's responsible? What's my role and now what? So it's who, how, and what, but the opposite way around. So that's the breath pattern. And I introduce that to groups when I'm gonna start working with them because it helps them to feel comfortable that we're a normal group because we're going to get into emergence. It's going to feel uncomfortable. 
In fact, I talked to a, a guy who was a professor of learning in Denmark at Aalborg University, and he said, it can actually be physically painful to try to get a new neural pathway in your brain. So if you've ever tried learning something and you've had a headache, you know that that's true, interestingly enough. Okay, so the geography of story. This is something Paul Costello talked to me about a long time ago, and I, and I picked that up from him because I thought it was so gorgeous. We know something about story. We know that it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. That's what people will commonly say. But what I learned from Paul was there's more to it than this. And the geography of finding out where you are in the story helps you know what to do. So this is an interesting thing. The French film director Jean-Luc Godard says a story should have a beginning, a middle, and an end, but not necessarily in that order. And if you watch French films, that's sometimes what you get. Like, where, I'm not sure about the storyline. It's not unfolding the way I thought. Uh, so beginning and middle and an end is what we classically think of in the story. But Paul said to me, look, the beginning has a beginning, a middle, and an end. The middle has a beginning, a middle, and an end. The end has a beginning, a middle, and the end. So this pattern is repeating itself at all times. And the interesting thing to know is that most often when we get into conflict with somebody else, even sometimes with ourselves, because we're in multiple stories at the same time, and they're in different stages. But when we get in conflict with other people, especially in organizational life, often it's because we assume they're in the same part of the story as we are, and they are not classic in change or transformation, that the people who are leading the change or transformation are at the end of the middle or the beginning of the end, when the people that they're working with aren't even at the beginning of the beginning, they don't even know it's going to happen. And so they get accused of dragging the chain or being resistant or reluctant when they're actually not in the same part of the story as we are. It's interesting to think about that. So let's see how story fits on top. You can probably guess where I'm going with this. It was interesting. That was such a aha moment in my mind. But the, begin, the divergence is the beginning. What classically happens at the beginning of a story is creation. It's about newness. It's about something arising and coming to be. And then you have the middle. That's the emergent piece. And we can call it the messy middle because usually it feels like a mess. You know, it's confusion. It's complexity. It's um, all of those kind of challenge, it's all of those kind of C words that you don't like are probably in the messy middle. And sometimes, you know, the only thing you can do is go, I declare a messy middle. <laughs> That's kind of helpful. And finally, the end is about completion. We know in stories that we like, we love a messy middle because we want to figure out what, what's the orientation and the motivation of the character. Why are they doing that? Is it a bad guy wanting to become a good guy? Is it somebody who wants to be saved, but not really? I mean, we're, we're all about the messy middle when we are in the stories we love. We don't just, but we don't love it in our own lives very much. We want to get out of it as fast as possible. But that's actually where the gold is if you can stay there fruitfully enough. So how do you do that? And when you hit a beginning, it's nice to begin with clarity, especially in a meeting. Who's here? Why are we here? What are we hoping to achieve? I've been in meetings where people have said, we all know why we're here. Let's get on with it. And I felt like I don't know why we're here. And I don't know the other people at the table. Can I please have an introduction round and, and you know, find out why this person has that look on their face like that? Is there something going on? Is it me? You know? So starting out well and clearly with clarity is really helpful. When you hit the messy middle, what you need is curiosity. Because what happens mostly in the messy middles, people go into some fear. They get triggered. They go, uh-oh, uh, I don't like conflict. What happens when you're fearful is you get painted into the corner of the room. But if you can stay curious, you're in the center of the room. You have an, a latitude to move in any direction. So what is your practice that will keep you present and curious no matter what happens? How do you host yourself in the messy middle, first of all, so that you can host others? And then finally, at the end, it's about conscious closure. Uh, we were in the Story Dojo yesterday, which is part of uh, the Story Cafe, which is part of the Story Dojo. And we were talking about beginnings and endings, because in the endings and in the beginnings, you can catch the essence of what comes next. And there was a woman in there who was in her 80s, and she was talking about her own conscious closure. And that really sparked a very interesting conversation about the Western world and how we don't necessarily like conscious closure. We don't pay attention to the fact there must be death in order for life to come again. That's part of the cycle. So I want to invite you just to think for a moment. 
on ponder some questions for yourself. So first of all, let's see if this is going to come up, whatever. Where are you in the story of life? What parts are ending, beginning, in the messy middle? What do you think? And I just want to pause for a moment and stop the screen share. Whoops, if I can. Let's go back to this. That popped me out of that kind of thing. And just ask, where are you in your own life? Where are you in the beginning, the middle, and the end? That might be in your work life. That might be in your story practitioner life. Where are the beginnings, middle, and endings for you? How are they feeling? Who's got something? I, I could say it's, something. Can, just before we do that, can we just mute Grace because there's noise happening in the background? I don't know what it is necessarily, but thank you. Go, Richard. Well, it, it's a good question because I feel uh, I'm certainly not at the beginning. Um, in terms of life cycle, <laughs> I'm going to be 70 years old in another week or so. Um, so, um, but I'm 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 definitely not at the end either because I feel I feel very generative still, and and I have a lot uh, that I'm interested in and continue to be interested in. Um, but it feels like there's a lot of ambiguity about it because I'm also aware of being 70 years old that. Um, I have friends who are peeling peeling away, you know, <laughs> they're they're leaving this 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 mortal coil. And yeah. so there's that question that lives always with me on my right shoulder. Uh, how many more years do I have? And I have, you know, and it's always there. And I think we can deny it more when we're younger. But as we get a little older, it becomes uh, an ever present question. You know, what what time do I have left and how do I want to spend it? And what's what's really valuable and important and, and and are some things that I used to value really inconsequential, you know, and um, so um, those are the questions I, I live in right now. Okay, so let me just ask you if you when you think about Paul's beginning, beginning of the beginning, middle of the, the middle of the middle, the end of the middle, beginning of the end, middle of the end, if you take it down to that level, where do you think you are? I'm more at the end, <clears throat> the end of the middle. <clears throat> the end of the middle. Okay. Yeah. That's what that's what it feels psychically for me. I feel that you know I've just got a new book out and I'm doing all kinds of stuff with that, and it feels like <clears throat> lots of things are opening up. So there are also some new beginnings in the middle of all that. So there are these little spirals of things going on. And you know, you've got the big macro story, and then there are these little micro stories that are evolving that uh, yeah. that have their own little life, you know. And interesting. Uh, yeah, that's thank you. Anybody else? Where are you? At? What? What? Where are the stories, Sarah? So, absolutely, what what Richard just said. Different aspects of my life, I'm at different places. So I'm older than you, Richard. <laughs> so there's that, um, and I have a birthday coming up soon as well. Um, but beginning new projects, so that's the beginning of the beginnings, and that's always lovely. Um, but in the middle of some things and. <clears throat> and at the end of some things, um, moving moving beyond finishing something up and then starting something new. So, and I hope that's always the way it's going to be. Okay, so where are you in the story of vocation? And as we know, vocation is quite different than work or career or job. You know, where are you on your kind of on your your heart your heart role in the world? Where's that? beginning, middle, and end? I think, well, I, I, I think I'm at the beginning of the middle of that in terms of storytelling and story um, creation and so on. So, but much more, um, working much more with that than I have in the past. So okay. that's what I would say for that, yeah. Anybody else on, on where you are in your vocation? Yeah, go. David, you've got to unmute yourself now. Somebody said to me yesterday, I'm going to get a t-shirt that says you're on mute. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I've always had a problem with anything called about the end. There's a, a, a theory called the sigmoid theory, S-I-G-M-O-I-D. And it's a continuation of S's and you keep improving your self, changing yourself all the way through it. I mean, I, I read several books at one time, pick it up, put it down. So I have several books going at the same time, several projects going at the same time. I don't ever see that there is an end to any of this. It's just building on and it continues to be the same project 
are the same experiences just expanding in life. I don't know that I've ever reached an end to anything, if that helps. So I don't like stories, that, and I hate French movies that have that end, and I can't stand that at all. I do like that storyline, but I don't necessarily buy into it all. But there is I, a, I took my mother to see Cloud Atlas, and she was like, I don't understand it. <laughs> OK, so that was a question about vocation. Where are we in the story of story in organizational life? And where do you think our story goes next? So I was kind of saying, OK, in 2003, I used to, I used to describe it like this. Storytelling in organizations is a, is a fresh green field, and there are some people out standing in it. <laughs> there were so few practitioners at that point in time. So where are we now in our story of story and organizations? I don't mean to jump in right again, but I, I look at this and so I'm in my 70s, okay? Cruising around, kind of moving on to other things, but my generational mental is so much different than what's happening in the last two or three years. And so when I look at organizations, my son's a professor at the university and I'd lecture and do different things. And I don't believe in self entitlement. I think everyone should work hard, which puts me in conflict with some people that think, well, the government should do everything for me. So when you have a group of people now with all this different generational things, I mean, it's not unusual for me to be someplace where people are from 20 to 45 or 50, all different thoughts as you go through those decades and they approach things all differently. It may not sound nice, but I grew up with my father saying, um, slow obedience is disobedience. Not the most friendly thing in the world, okay? Um, but that's how he grew up. So, you know, to me, if you're not there five or 10 minutes early, you're kind of late. That's just, but that's me. And I have, then have to balance that with an organization of people that, I mean, 20 years ago when I used to give, give seminars and talks, I, I closed the door. When I started at eight o'clock, the door got locked at eight o'clock. You were late to that. Yeah, it doesn't fly very well nowadays. So to go to your question as to how do you, where are we now? I think we're at a real mix, a potpourri of individuals that all look at things differently. And so when you have your cloud and mixed things, some people look at it and go, well, everyone should have it equally. And then there's some people going, well, you know, everyone should work equally and be hard at something. So I think we're at a real potpourri of that work mixes nowadays. Go, oh, Janet. So my experience with where we're at in storytelling and organizations, I think we're in the messy middle. I personally love the messy middle. It's my favorite. <laughs> so maybe I'm just drawn to it. But it, um, really to, because I think so many creative things come out of the messy middle. And I think there's a general acceptance that there is a role for storytelling. Um, and you so eloquently put it in your introduction that as story is commoditized, it's also misunderstood. So the, the real role of storytelling, I feel, is still very much in its um, in that creative, messy middle stage. But it's there. It's not in the beginning stages where we were just introducing and almost constantly needing to illustrate why it's important. My thoughts. Mary Allen? You don't no longer get that question. You want to do what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Jules. I think with the up and coming generations that have grown up on digital devices, they are used to telling each other a version of their story or things that are happening to bring it forward and use it in new ways, I think is an opportunity right now, especially coming through this pandemic period where We've seen much more vulnerability in calls and meetings because we've had to 
create a new reality on these screens and really have a holistic relationship with our employees or our clients. So I think there's opportunities to go. It does get commoditized in advertising news, so I feel like a little protective sometimes that it's going to lose the, uh, the beauty of it. But I think with a lot of good storytellers that are like here, I think there's still a lot of opportunity and lots of things that we can be working on and achieving with that gift and keeping everybody uh, together and finding new conversations to have. I, I'm optimistic of where it's going. I was intrigued too that this, the Russian conference I went to the first time, um, we had a group session. I asked people to tell stories to each other and they were kind of a bit, what, you know, because and I've hit this. I've hit this as I go across borders. When if I ever tell somebody I'm a storyteller, they say, "Do you, so?" That means you tell story. You read books to kids in libraries. You know that's what you classically get. Um, there was a time when I used to travel with my my tingshaws, these bells, because I like to use bells. A bell is a really great way to make 300 people be quiet. <laughs> you don't have to yell at them. You just go ding, and they're all like, "What?" Um, but they, I'd always get stopped in the airport. And there was one time I said, would you like me to ring the bell for you? The guy went, okay, ding. And he stood there, this look on his face like this, this huh? and then he said, would you do that again? <laughs> so that's kind of, it's, and story has that same kind of sense. So this, the Russian folk, they kind of looked at me like I was really strange. And half of them, of course, were listening to translation. So I can't know what the person said. But they all did the exercise. And afterwards, somebody said, I, I am feeling strangely warm right here, <laughs> which I thought actually was really, really beautiful, but also said something to me about what might be happening in organizational life. Years ago in New Zealand, I had a business card. Each of us, I was working with like some colleagues and we had fold out, kind of a fold out business card. So we had a list of things that we each specialized inside and we had a sense of humor. So one of, the, one of their cards said goldfish grooming and one of them said Rottweiler reprogramming. It, actually, she was very good at that. And uh, mine said heart massage. And people used to think that was really funny. And I realized after a while, no, I'm serious. That's what I do inside of teams. Hmm. That's actually my job. It's reanimation sometimes. It's bringing the heart back to life. There's something really important about that. Any other comments on where we are now with story? I, I think it's in organizations, it's still very much at the beginning. And, you know, when I was doing this back in the 90s, I mean, there was no, there, there was no SIO. <laughs> it was before the Golden Fleece folk uh, times. You were the forerunner, Richard. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know, you know, but, you know, I was yeah. out. Uh, and and, and what, I'm, what I'm astounded by today is people are like, they're discovering story for the first time. So I, I think that, uh, you know, there's a few a few people like who are here today are sort of plowing, you know, out there plowing and planting. And, um, but there's a lot of big fields that have not even been touched. And, and people are still sort of astounded to discover story, just mm -hmm. like your experiences when people just for the first time hear a story. And, and I think there's a, a, a great deal of ignorance within organizations regarding how stories operate within the organization, how they impact performance, how they uh, impact their possibilities. So uh, I think there's still, a, it, it's nascent mm -hmm. still, I think. You know. I'm noticing Roth Communication this has their hand up and I'm, I'm curious to see who that is. Oh, hi. Hi, that's me. <laughs> I'm Stuart, Stuart, Stuart Roth. Hi, hi, Stuart. Hi, Roth, hi. Thank you for wonderful presentations. Very interesting, especially around meetings. Um, the situation that I find is that storytelling is a buzzword and it's being used everywhere. So I'm mostly operating in, in Africa. Mm. Uh, we're based in South Africa, we operate across the region, also in North America, but in, at least here, everyone wants to do storytelling. Um, and the problem we have is that we actually, well, I have to educate people about what storytelling is, how it works in different contexts, what it's not. Mm. And uh, you have every single producer becomes a freelance um, videographer suddenly kind of goes from news into so-called storytelling. And so I actually wrote an article about this um, <clears throat> a few years ago. And the, uh, we have the opposite where organizations ask us to come and help them with st strategic storytelling and we give them a proposal and they say, oh, well, one of the board members' nieces is a storyteller, so we're gonna go with her. And so there needs to be um, a professionalization of 
the the craft or the industry. Um, I don't think that's that's happened yet, and it's it's quite difficult. And I think it speaks a little bit to the messiness of individual practitioners like all of us. Um, and and maybe it's something to think about because I think we are in the messy middle, and I think that going forward we might need to think, you know, how do we make some kind of how do we differentiate between all the different people that are so-called storytellers, which could be everything from children's stories, as you said, to performing, um, to story collectors, more like myself, um, from the research anthropology side, uh, for storytelling and communications, for advocacy. So I, I think we, someone somewhere needs to start differentiating and educating people about this new buzzword, because it's certainly a buzzword down here. I think it's more advanced in North America, but here it's still in its beginning of the beginning, I would say. Maybe the middle of the beginning of phase. Hmm. Thanks. This is an interesting conversation with many, many parts too, because there's the part of who is a storyteller? Okay, if you're human, that's what I was, when I was kind of writing the, the end to, to this book, I was uh, saying, you don't have to have a library card or a barcode in order to be a storyteller. It's in your DNA. You are one. But then there's that what makes you skillful as a storyteller? You know, professional storytellers have that thing too about what makes you a good storyteller. And having been in the facilitation industry for a long time as they've gone through accreditation and I've felt myself kind of going, okay, who's measuring this? Who's monitoring it and who decided and who's, who's giving that little stamp and why? You know, it's like, and they've, the IF, the International Association of F Facilitators just come up with something new. And I don't know if that's to differentiate themselves as an organization or if it's actually really of service to the field. So it's an interesting thing. In Art of Hosting, we've said to each other, if there's ever an Art of Hosting tea set, you can shoot us all. <laughs> because what we're trying to do is give something that anybody could do because it's a human, it should be a human capacity. But along that thinking, Jay, uh, David Hutchins and David Drake and I, so David Hutchins does leadership um, storytelling. David Drake is the founder of Narrative Coaching Field. And we were in conversation for about two years when we kind of decided after all of our talking around the fire with each other that we felt there were three waves of story. The first wave is story for influence. And we're in the middle of that wave quite powerfully right now. People want to have you no know, storytelling because they want to build a personal brand. They want to um, give their leadership story and have people uh, trust in them. They want to tell the story of their product and have people trust in that. So storytelling for influence was the first wave. Then we think storytelling for sense and meaning making for collective wisdom is the second wave. And that happens to be the part of the wave I'm in and I like a lot because whenever I'm together with a group, that's what I'm using story for. I want to help them understand that their, their individual lived experience has gold in it. It's important and we can learn from each other and everybody's carrying a part of this gold. And if we, if we put our wisdom together, we've lifted all the boats essentially. So I love it when people do PhDs, but I think when people collectively make sense and meaning, we have raised the wisdom quotient inside of a group and maybe even inside of an organization. And then we said, we think the third wave is healing and holing. So a truth and reconciliation commission is a healing and holing initiative. And I'm sitting in, sitting in the U.S., I can say, wow, we need some story for healing and holing. Oh, boy, do we ever need it. And the world, and it seems in the world, collective trauma is so rising. This is, it's important to become skillful because that's actually what's underpinning a lot of what's going on at this moment. And the pandemic has stirred that. So I cheerfully went out once we had decided this, and I wrote three blog posts. And I put my first blog post on LinkedIn about story for influence. And, you know, 4,000 people read it. And I'm like, man, I have started a great blogging career. This is great. Put out the next one on collective sense and meaning making. 802 people read that. And in New Zealand, I lived in New Zealand for almost 29 years, we'd say, my inner pact is sad at that moment. Kind of, you know, I was a bit sad. And then I put out the third one. 200 people read that. And at first I was really upset. And then I went, wait a minute, we're right. <laughs> we just did a little piece of research that showed we were right. That most people were focusing on the influence. Far less people were focusing on collective sense and meaning making. And by far less than that understood the healing capacity about story that's so vitally needed right now. And what I've understood working in organizations and groups is that healing, whether it's overt or covert, is needed before people can do the good work together. And that might be as small as, I'm sorry, I didn't return your call last week. I didn't mean to ignore you. Two, 
wow, we have not included this voice at the table and why have we been so blind? So it's interesting to look at those kind of waves and say, how are they? And there's a, there are <laughs> three blog posts on my site if you wanna go and look, look up that, that conversation. I've also put it as a, it's a chapter in a book called Transforming Organizations that was put out by Springer Verlag in Germany. But it's interesting to think about those things. So that was kind of the end of what I wanted to say to you folk, and I'm interested in questions you have. And in the chat one, I've just put where you can get in touch with me. If there's a, a site about my work. There's one about the book. If you want to, are you interested in the, reading about the book, please have a look there. And we've just opened the Story Dojo, which is a community which is intentional about the power and practice of story. And following on from the summit I did in 2018, which was called Story the Future, the focus of the Story Dojo really is about all the different aspects of story and its practice to try to broaden that sense. It's not just about leadership storytelling. It's not all about telling a good story. It's about all the ways from research to leadership, to healing, to holding, to you know everything that we're doing. How do we bring all of that together and say, all of this is story. So thank you. Wow, Mary Alice, thank you so much. That was just fabulous. Yes, you can see all of us are. <laughs> but Tom was like, Tom was going, was this like, I have something to say, Tom? Uh, well, I, I, I think we were gonna do questions. Is that right, Sarah? Yes, mm -hmm. it's time, it's time, go for it. Yeah, and I was just, thinking as you described the three areas of story. If uh, I was like, well, they're not mutually exclusive. And then as I looked at them, I'm like, I wonder if they're in ever widening uh, order that like influence is the most specific and then meaning making is a little wider, but always, you know, you, you can't have influence if you don't have meaning making, it would seem. And then really holding and healing, that's even wider, you know, it's, it's, and I wondered if you had thoughts about that and how, what are their areas that they overlap? I can say quite categorically, I've gotten very tired of linear kind of models. So I, that's not how my brain usually thinks. I think a lot in kind of overlapping circles. And I've always wondered who Venn was, you know, it's, that's traditionally called a Venn diagram. And I was like, is there a Mrs. Venn? Who had that idea? I don't know. But yeah, I, was I'm, seeing, I was seeing, you know, like influence. Almost like this. Woo -woo. Yeah. 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 Um, but. On the other hand, it could, it could go woo, 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 because, you know, actually, as you move in, you need to be more skillful. Mm. So which is more skillful? If you drop the pebble in the pool, what goes out first? Is that influence? I don't know. Like, do you have to be, do you have to be more skillful to heal and hold something than you do to just have influence? Mm. I don't know. Mm, interesting. I, I think it has a lot to do with the world of commerce. You know, people want to influence in order to sell something. And that's, there's a lot of motivation for that. Mm. A lot of reward for that. Um, there's not a lot of reward for healing. Mm -hmm. There's you know, not external rewards, you know. Um, and it's often an afterthought. Um, I would add to the Venn diagram envisioning. And I think that uh, that maybe we tell stories more to envision what's possible rather than to make sense of the past. We make sense of the past, but it's often as a springboard for thinking about how do we want to do something different? Um, where do we want to go? I think those are compelling questions today. And story has, I think, a lot to contribute to that as well. Mm. Jay, did you have something? Janet, you were going to say something? Yeah. So I, I think this is a fascinating conversation. And of course, when um, 
with Tom, when you talked about the the three circles, of course, I always think of Simon Sinek's three circles, which, you know, he's done such a good job of talking about our how, what, and why. And also interested in the comment on commerce in terms of, um, Richard, what you were saying about, you know, influences where it's at and people want to sell products. But I think what we're learning is it's it's not sustainable to only use influence, um, to use story as a as a way to influence for selling. And that it is only when we add that larger meaning and potentially that healing that a sustainable model for commerce exists. And, and I see that changing um, as different generations come up. You know, the millennials were the first to start to sort of say, really tell me what you're about and, and walk the talk before I want to be part of buying your product or influencing your product. Certainly they're not the only ones, but they did, they didn't start that. So I find it interesting of which way the, the circles go. It's been interesting. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Stuart. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think that, um, as Tom said, they're not mutually exclusive, um, but certainly they, they, they mirror sort of what we deal what we see in the greater world. So the, you know, the influence is about selling your products or selling your brand. Um, and then further down, maybe there's some internal communications around meaning and purpose. Um, and then the last one is around healing, which is, is I think it just it mirrors the external. But what I've seen in, um, for example, in running storytelling for values workshops is that they, they start to mix together. So, you know, the organization has to roll out its new values and they find storytelling. So we, we do this work with the executive and people start um, start moving down, down the rung, so to speak. So they start speaking about, um, you know, it's personal stories because there's such a strong container. And I don't think that we're our responsibility is, is to heal. Um, I think our responsibility is to hold the space so the healing can take place through mm -hmm. storytelling is one, one aspect. So we've had, we've had a, you know, a, chief, a head of operations come out during the Storytelling for Values workshop. Um, I mean, it was pretty obvious anyway, but he, just, he was so empowered, he felt so safe that he decided to come out in the middle of this to his executive, um, which then in turn allowed someone else, one of his juniors to come out to him months later. So, so we started the healing process. We also had, different divisions speaking to each other. You know, so IT and HR are saying, oh, we didn't know that you actually had a new operating system, um, which is part of sort of the second run. Um, and so I think that, that these things, they, they do move and depending on how skilled the facilitator is, um, and I'm not, you know, a particularly skilled one. I had a very good uh, co-facilitator who's extremely skilled, Carissa Berta. But you can, you can actually start off, with, and that's maybe the point I want to leave with is that the way in for many organizations is through the top rung. So, you, so they all know about storytelling for influence and it's a new buzzword, as I said. So you can go in on that level and slowly start to introduce them to meaning, purpose, and then eventually healing, collaboration, cooperation, and, and visioning as well. Uh, but to try and go in at, at that bottom rung, it's very hard, at least in the, the corporate space here. Mm -hmm. they, they, the furthest they can go is around values. Um, and that's usually because they've been instructed to kind of roll out a new set of values, et cetera. Um, thanks. But I think you've, you've pointed to a really important point there. And that is, so that in the art of hosting field, we talk about the fourfold practice. That's about how do you do your personal practice? And the, the, the main one in there, the first one is called host yourself. So I've kind of taken that and I've looked at it from a story perspective. How do I work with my own story material to make sure I'm as clear and as present as possible? Because when people are getting triggered, they're getting pinged on a storyline. That's usually what's happening. But often it's so far beneath the surface that they don't know that's why they're <laughs> angry or upset in the moment. They don't realize their story material has been hit on. So how do I work with my own story material so that I can be really present to somebody else? Because I've, I've realized over time, it's not the technique we bring, it's who we bring, who we are in that moment. Like you've pointed to, how do you hold the space for that? When somebody's done their own deep work, that tends to happen around them because they're trustworthy enough. They can hold the deep enough space. And that only works when we work with our own story material. So it's like almost we've got to come first 
if we actually want to hold brave and transformative spaces for other people. Mm -hmm. We've got to work on our own story material. And then the second piece is how do I, how do I be hosted? How do I be in a group setting and host in this, from the seat, from the chair? I'm not the leader of the group, but how do I host somebody else's? How do I invite somebody else's story to come in? I'd like to hear your story on that. And then the third piece is how do we host and harvest conversations that matter? Meaning where is that conversation with my name on it? Where do I want to hold space for good story sharing to happen that maybe nobody else can do because it's my call? And then the, the fourth piece is how do I be in a community of practice? This is one. You know, how do I be with other people to kind of polish my act and show me where I can get more skillful in the practice that I'm doing? Who do I hang out with that can up my game? No matter where I am, like I'm looking at Richard here and Sarah, and like no matter where I am in the in the storyline, having multi-generations and multi-level of experience in a group is really great because you get your learning edges pointed to by somebody else. And sometimes that's not comfortable. You know, I always say, I love learning, not necessarily in the moment when it happened. (laughs) (laughs) Jules, go ahead. I want to just second what I heard um, Stuart say about the organizations and starting at the top. I mean, one of my roles in the past was to be the person looking at the turnover and the retention and doing a lot of interviews after the fact. And one of the most important things you can do to curtail departures is to acknowledge people where they are in their space, respect their experience, not necessarily fix everything, but just appreciate because I used to look at and say, how can I calculate that tipping point where that person said, well, nobody's really hearing my work experience or where I am in in this whole organization. And that's usually when they start to look elsewhere or just feel like, okay, I'm done with this relationship. So I think now more than ever, given how everybody's experienced multiple realities in a given day, that we can't be typical in our way of, oh, we have a check mark, let's go through our agenda, I'm fine, so let me move through my day and ignore the fact that everybody else's experiences are a lot different right now. So I think acknowledgement and respect is gonna be much more important um, competency for leaders to remind themselves and managers and directors and all the way down the food chain to just build that into their their experience and how they connect with their teams. It's an interesting thing to consider what your window of opportunity is wherever you're going into like, Stuart, you know, listening to you saying, okay, we're doing the values work. I'm in a, I've just newly joined a book club I was invited to, and the former um, learning director for NASA is part of it. Ooh. So he said to me, here's what he had learned. He said, if they invite, you know, they might like you, 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 whatever, then they invite you in, and then your window of opportunity is 18 months. That's the amount of time you get before the finance people catch up with you and say, this is not part of our core skills. This is not part of what we normally do. This is not our product, you know, so uh, now your window is over. So I'm always intrigued when people go, okay, leadership, dot, we did that. No, you know, because whenever you have human beings, you've got complexity. It's not complicated, it's complex. There's going to be complexity. You are never done on the people side. You can't ever be done because human beings are never done. But it's interesting how inside of organizational structures, you go, no, okay, no, you had your program done. We're on to the next thing. So it's an, I, I find that a very interesting question. And that comes back to what Janet was saying too about, being commodity, being a flavor of the month, how do we really say this is an intrinsic capacity? Everybody needs to have this capacity. We need to pay attention to this capacity because it's actually running the show. Like if you are not making story your ally, it becomes what defines you. So who's in the driver's seat, you or it? It's gonna be one of the two of you. (laughs) Hey, Mary Alice, um, uh, can you remind us of your definition or do you define story? It, it almost seems like it's synonymous, synonymous with uh, life. Uh, and I'm, I'm just wondering how you might define it. Somebody asked me that once and I said, I, I think a story is a bite-sized piece of meaning making. A bite-sized mm-hmm. piece of meaning making. Yeah, because if I think about life, what's life? Well, in the last, and I was thinking of a water metaphor, like life is like a a river that's continually rushing on and eventually joins the sea. That's when you depart the planet. 
And sometimes that river is placid and flat, and sometimes it's a, a grade five, and you, you're really having to paddle hard to stay in the raft. <laughs> you know, so it's always changing, and therefore it's always going on. And, and how we make sense of it is by taking a snapshot that has a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? We're attempting to make some meaning by having this little snapshot. Well, it seems like sometimes it's more than bite sized, or maybe we're condensing an entire life and career into the bite-sized view. Uh, I think so, because, you know, when we're working with people on story, you can't, you can't include everything. It becomes overwhelming. If you included all the minutia of your life. Sure. There wouldn't be a story, right? There has, because there's some common elements. There's got to be kind of some character. There's got to be a, a situation. There's got to be some up and down movement. Other because the stories we don't remember, I, I remember being at the NSN conference in Oklahoma City. Sarah, were you there for that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we heard stories from people who'd been in the Oklahoma City bombing. Mm -hmm. And one of them said, she started her story, it was a beautiful day. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to many people who've been in disasters and most often they start their story by saying, it was a beautiful day. Mm. And this woman's story went on to say that she had been at work in a, in a room that they were having a meeting and she had turned to the whiteboard to write something on the whiteboard when the bomb went off. And when she turned around, everyone else was gone and there was a big hole in the floor. Mm. I've never forgotten that one. That's yeah. what I would call a big S story. <laughs> but our life is full of little S stories. What happened when I went to the grocery store and this woman turned to me and said, and she, and she only can see this much of me right now at this moment. She says to me, you have such beautiful hair. I wish my hair were that beautiful now. And I could turn to her and say, I read that Emerson wrote, as I grow older, my beauty steals inward. Maybe you just have to be beautiful all over. And I heard her go, and then we walked on. Like that's a little less story. So life is full of those kind of things too, but the bigger, the red threads, the bigger patterns are the kind of what, what you pull out of, out of that. So and I don't I, know if I'm, I have a classic answer. Thank you so much. I, I can't believe it. I have to tell you guys, we have to stop, <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I suspect that many of these discussions continue in the story dojo. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have, we have two parts of the Story Dojo. Besides, you know, cool community there, we have um, a theme every month and we have you know, the second Monday of the month, the fireside conversation. So we have someone come to our fire and put a log on the fire around their aspect of story and the theme that we have. And then the fourth Monday of the month, we have a story cafe where it's kind of like coming to a real cafe. You can either sit around the fireside or you can go, go, hey, Stuart, hey, Tom, let's go to a breakout space and have a a conversation and so you can do that too so those are the kind of two movements and you'd be most welcome please join us thank you so mary alice put in uh in the chat the contact information for her for her book and the story dojo and her website and we can go and look at those um, blog posts and so on gosh thank you so much um, shout out to Stuart in south africa board member for sio glad you're here and everybody who, who was able to come today and then of course we have the recording so those who weren't able to come will be able to to catch up with this wonderful conversation and presentation and thinking that's gone into what you shared mary alice just super i uh, just want to remind you that the uh, national storytelling network we're part of the national storytelling network check out their website we have uh, the annual conference coming up in July, National Storytelling Network, and we have a piece of that. And um, Rick Stone is going to be our guest next month, May 27th. So mm -hmm. we'll get to hear more from Rick about his thinking about all these topics and what he's working on as well. So I just want to thank you all and um, have a wonderful day, a wonderful week, a wonderful month. Thank you so Bravo. much. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. Thank you. Have a great yeah. time. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. And great to see Roger here, too. Good to see you, Roger. And yes. Look forward yes. to it, Richard. Yeah. Thanks so much. It's good to be here. Yeah. Awesome, it's, Mary Alice. Thank you so much. Is the NSN conference a virtual one this year? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This year, maybe next year. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, so Julius, you're going to start recording, I guess, and uh, we'll say yeah. goodbye. I didn't want to cut anyone off. Okay. I know, it's been fabulous, fabulous. Okay. Yeah. All righty, thanks.